Welcome, saints. Welcome, welcome, welcome to each and every single one of you. Happy, blessed Sabbath to you all. It is good that we are able to be back here tonight to uh, finalize this series, Numbering Our Days. Good evening and happy, blessed Sabbath to every single one of you, wherever it is that you may be tuning in from. I wish and I pray that God's presence, God's grace be upon you, but not only upon you, but also upon your family upon your friends, upon all those who you would take a moment to share this video with. I urge, I recommend, I suggest, I, I, I would that you share this study with your brothers, your sisters, your friends, your whole entire family, everyone it is that you know. God has a special truth, a special word for us tonight as we are finalizing this series, Numbering Our Days. Saints, it has been a great pleasure, a joy, an honor really and truly to have been able to go through the the, the history, high-level history of Adventism, looking at um, our days as a people whom God has called to be his last people in this world to finish the work of representing him really and truly before this sin-sick world. Saints, tonight is a special night. Tonight is a special night, so I don't want you to miss anything it is that God has to share with us. Happy Blessed Sabbath, Sister Nicole Beckford. I pray that God is with you and with your family as well. So before we get started, before we even pray, there's a few things that I want to share. Number one, last week I shared the announcement to all the men ministers. Men ministers, please send us an email at lastrayministries at gmail.com. We want to connect with you. We want to connect with you. We have thoughts. We have things that we want to pass by your way. We want to be able to get into communication and in contact with you. So uh, men, ministers, my friends, brothers, send us an email at lastrayministries at gmail.com. And we will continue our conversation from there. Um, there's some things I want to share with you and some things I believe that by the grace of God, we can do to be a blessing to his people and also to the world. So, saints, as we are going to come to the conclusion of this series, um, I'm going to begin with a word of prayer. So wherever it is that you are, wherever it is that you are, I want you to take a moment to clear your mind. Allow your mind to be cleared from the challenges of this week. Be cleared from all the things that the enemy would try to push you away. Allow your minds to see Jesus and Jesus Christ alone. It is his peace that we need. He is the stability of our times. It's his rest that you and I need. So take a moment to allow Christ to fill your heart and minds. And let's tonight's study final study of this series, bring you to the place where you would apply your heart to wisdom. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for this Sabbath. We're grateful for this final study of our series, Numbering Our Days. Lord, we see how precious life and our days are. And you've called for us under inspiration to learn to number our days so that we could apply our hearts to wisdom, to learn to reflect on our days. Good, the bad, and the ugly. Lord, we would number our days so that we could apply our hearts to wisdom. Lord, we ask that you may forgive us of all of our sins and cleanse us of our unrighteousness. We seek to be more like Christ and experience his peace in such a time as this. Lord, we need a change in our life. And we're asking for you to bring that change into us. Bless us, Father. Help us, Father. Be with all those who are tuned in right now. I pray that your grace and that your peace may fall upon their hearts. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 
Amen. Numbering our days. Psalms chapter 90 and verse 12. That's where we get the text from. Psalms chapter 90 and verse 12. There the Bible says, Teach us to number our days so that we may apply our hearts to wisdom. This is a very important text, especially for we living in these final moments of our history. How are you living out your days? How are you living out your days? The Bible says that the tongue of the wise uses knowledge aright. That's in the book of Proverbs and chapter 15. The tongue of the wise, Proverbs chapter 15, and that is verse 1, either verse 1 or verse 2. Proverbs chapter 15, there the Bible says, uh, verse 1 is a soft answer turneth away wrath. Grievous words stir up anger. And verse 2, the tongue of the wise uses knowledge aright, but the mouth of fools pours out foolishness. The tongue of the wise uses knowledge aright. What that means is that wisdom is the righteous use of knowledge. When you have knowledge and understanding of something, and you use that knowledge in the right way, according to righteousness, then you are living according to wisdom. That's wisdom. That's wisdom. Wisdom is using knowledge the right way. Using knowledge the right way. We are to receive knowledge from God through his Holy Spirit. The teacher of righteousness according to righteousness. We've spent a decent amount of time throughout this series studying the latter rain. The teacher of righteousness according to righteousness. He would teach us righteousness so that we could use that which we have learned aright and be wise. When we study our days, when we number our days, when we reflect on our days, there we can become wise by seeing and understanding the things that have happened in the past, having a memory that God has given to us to remember those things and make right decisions for the future. We have nothing to fear for the future lest we forget the way that the Lord has led us. When we think about that way, those days, when we number those days, the things that God has done for us, we have nothing to fear. We have absolutely nothing to fear because if God be for us, then who can be against us? When we number our days, we see all those that have been against us. We see all those who have persecuted, per persecuted us. We see all those who have not been there for us. We see all those who have pressed us down, but we also see the one who has lifted us up. As the song says, love lifted me. When nothing else could help, love lifted me. Number our days so that we could apply our hearts to wisdom using righteousness, using knowledge in the right way. Not according to other people's thoughts, not according to other people's ideas, not according to other people's perceptions, but according to what is true, according to the righteousness of God in Christ. So in learning to number our days, we've considered it from two perspectives. We considered it from the perspective of the world, as well as the perspective, perspective of the church, us as a denomination, the Seventh-day Adventist church. Blessed Sabbath, Patrick and Rodney. Happy Blessed Sabbath to you, brothers. So as we've said, we've considered, we've considered, we've considered from the world and from us as a people, the church. And we spent some time in the book of Matthew in chapter 24, Jesus speaking to the disciples, letting them know the things that would occur just before the second coming, just before he would return to this world. He explained to them the calamities that would befall them. He explained to them the deaths that would occur. He explained to them the natural disasters that would occur. And then he went on to say that these are just the beginning of sorrows. And then he said, this generation will not pass until all these things shall be fulfilled. This generation will not pass. 
until all these things be fulfilled. And we studied, like, what generation is that? What generation was that? And that generation was the generation just before the second coming of Jesus. Because we saw in Matthew in chapter 24 that after Christ said that, he was speaking about the second coming of the Son of Man. So that is the generation just before the second coming of Jesus. And we saw in the book of Daniel speaking about the last generation, speaking about the time of the end, those who would be in the end. We saw that the time of the end began after began after 1798. So God would have a generation of people. This generation and that generation would come sometime after 1798. That last generation of God's people that would finish the work. Because in the book of Daniel chapter 8, it spoke about the sanctuary needing cleansing. And we've studied the sanctuary service in the past. We're familiar with the sanctuary service where, 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 where once a year, the people would have to have a holy convocation. The people would have to unite with God. It was a day of expiation, the day of judgment, Yom Kippur, the day of atonement. That day of atonement was the day where everyone's sins were to be cleansed. From the sanctuary and thus from their hearts. That was typical in the Jewish yearly service. That was that. But there is an antitype, meaning that there is a, a parallel, a reflection of the, the true picture. That was a shadow of the true. Right now, we are living in the antitypical day of atonement. The sanctuary in heaven is what is being cleansed right now. The sanctuary in heaven is what is being cleansed or vindicated or restored is the word. And God would have a people who would be restored, which would be made evident in the sanctuary being restored. So we considered all of that and we were considering, well, who is that generation? Where is that generation? When is that generation going to come on the scene? And as we continue to study things, as we continue to study and look for this generation, we saw that there was a people that were coming together out of the Protestant Reformation. This people came out of Babylon. So God had a people that was coming out of Babylon since after 1798, even before. God was having a people from different denominations that ended up coming together. And right there about October 22nd, not about, but right precisely there, October 22nd, 1844, Christ had a great appointment moving from the holy place into the most holy place. And his people moved with him. They didn't understand everything, but they were studying. They were following Christ where he was going. They were following him. And so that people that had left Babylon, we studied this, that had left Babylon, they formed a movement that is the third angels movement. They were following the bridegroom. And, 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 we, and we considered how in Matthew 24, Christ was speaking about uh, this generation, which shall not pass until all these things shall be fulfilled. That is the generation before the second coming of Jesus Christ. And then in Matthew chapter 25, Christ gives, gave some parables, uh, prophetic guides, not prophecies, but prophetic guides showing us the people and their condition before he returns. And that prophetic guide was very much in line with the experience of God's people, October 22nd, 1844. They slept, but then they arose to meet the bridegroom. Yes, that was the cry uh, that the bridegroom cometh, go you out to meet him. And that's what they did. Now, that generation. That generation, which is the Seventh-day Adventist movement that we're speaking of right now, they received special truths from God. They received special truths from God. In fact, there's a statement I would share with you right now from um, sec, uh, Testimonies to the Church, Volume 2. Wrong one. There we go. Testimonies to the Church, Volume 2, page 693, paragraph 1. A very important statement. We've read it before. We read it again. Special truths, special truths have been adapted 
to the conditions of the generations as they have existed. The present truth, which is a test for the people of this generation, was not a test to the people of the generations far back. That's all I want to take from that. The thought here is that special truths have been adapted to the, to the conditions of the generations as they have existed. God has always had special truths for each generation. If you were to go back to the uh, Dark Ages, that is where the Roman Catholic Church, the papacy, was persecuting the people of God. For 1,260 years, they were persecuting the people of God, killing them who would simply read the word of God. There were men that were arising over time, throughout the ages, John Wycliffe, Huss and Jerome, Zwingli, the Swiss reformer. You had many men who would come about Latimer, John Calvin, um, I'm not forgetting him. I'm just saving his name for a moment. Wesley, John Wesley and his brother. Of course, Martin Luther. These men were preaching a very special truth. A very special message, which wherever it is that it went, it would light a fire. It would revolutionize the way that people thought, the way that people lived. The view of people on life and on God. They were preaching justification by faith in the righteousness of Christ alone. Oh, when they were preaching these messages, many of them had a very similar experience where they recognized themselves to be so lost. John Bunyan, another one, recognized themselves to be so lost until they read the words of Scripture, until they saw Jesus as he was. You see, when you don't know Jesus, haven't met him, have no idea about what, what, what he comes with, you know how the Bible says, taste and see that the Lord is good. When you don't know, you don't know. You are in pure and utter darkness. That's where they were. That's why it was called the dark ages. But there was a light coming through the darkness. And they were receiving the light of life that is Jesus Christ. And they were preaching that message of justification by faith and the righteousness of Christ. Now, while they didn't have the whole entire message, they had sufficient light to shine in the darkness. They had sufficient light to shine in the darkness. But the darker it is, the more light you need. The Bible lets us know in the book of Isaiah and chapter 60 that, that the earth is going to be in utter and grosser darkness in these last days. But in these same last days, God is going to have a generation that will lighten the earth with his glory. You see, as we were numbering our days, we were talking about, as we were numbering our days, we were considering it from the perspective of the church, but also from the perspective of the world. Both of those th two things are very much intertwined. You can't really separate religion um, uh, uh, from, uh, from, from secular realities because, they are, they, they, be, be, because God is. But the thinking men of this world, the thinking men of this world, even as the wise men, who wanted to see Jesus, the thinking men of this world are also numbering their days and have been observing the things that have been going on in this world. And through their observation, they have been coming to the conclusion that something great, something momentous is to happen in the time right now that we are living in, in this last generation. It's... Uh... Here that we considered this slide in the past from this book, The Fourth Turning, a book written by secular men, historians. In fact, um, Sister White says that, let's do this, there we go. She says this, she says, the present is a time of overwhelming interest to all living rulers and statesmen, men who occupy positions of trust and authority, thinking men and women. Thinking men and women 
of all classes have their attention fixed upon the events taking place about us. Are there events going around around us around about us right now? Yes, there are. And the thinking men and women, they're considering those events. Are you numbering your days? Are you looking at current events and what's going on right now? It is aligned with prophecy. It is time to get our homes in order. Let me keep on reading. They're watching the strained, restless relations that exist among the nations. They observe the intensity that is taking possession of, earth, of every earthly element and recognize that something great and decisive is about to take place. The world is on the verge of a stupendous crisis. Great changes are soon to take place in our world. And the final movements will be rapid ones. Now, she's saying here, that the thinking men and women of this world, they're looking, they're observing at everything that's going on. And they're seeing that something great is going to happen. Now, let me read to you what they have said. If you haven't seen it before, you're going to see it now. This is what they have said. They have said, around the year 2005, a sudden spark will catalyze a crisis mood. Remnants of the old social order will disintegrate. Political and economic trust will implode. Real hardship will beset the land with severe distress that could involve questions of class, race, nation, and empire. Let me pause there. Let me pause there and say this. This book was written back in 1994, and these men were saying that something's going to happen around 2005. Now, they weren't precisely correct, but they were decently accurate. Because if you count a few years before 2005, you have 2001. And there was a crisis that occurred in 2001. Don't you remember what happened in 2001? Don't you remember what happened in 2001, Faith and Purple? Brother Rodney, in 2001, something happened, Brother Patrick. Something happened in 2001, 9-11. In fact, if you go to the book, Testimonies to the Church, Volume 9, on page 11, 12, 13, and 14 as well. It speaks about things that are very much related to what happened 9 11, 2001. So they were saying 2005, back in 1994, but um, it happened a little bit earlier than that. But if it wasn't 2001, well, it was still around 2005 because a few years after 2005, in 2008, something else happened. Another great crisis, an economic crisis, the financial meltdown, the Great Recession. So this book right over here is a result of thinking men of this world observing the rhythms uh, of history and seeing the patterns of the rise and the fall of nations. And they were seeing that, okay, based upon history, based upon the way that things have been happening in 20-year intervals, Around 2005, something bad is going to happen. And something did happen, which was related to the economy as well as related to the society. I'll reread it again. Around the year 2005, a sudden spark will catalyze a crisis mood. Remnants of the old social order will disintegrate. Remnants of the old social order will disintegrate. So if the old social order is disintegrating, and that means that there will be a new social order, a new world order. Political and economic trust will implode. Did we just talk about things related to politics and things related to um, economy? Yes. Political and economic trust will implode. Real hardship will beset the land with severe distress that could involve questions of class, race, nation, and empire. Yet this time of trouble, what? Wait a minute. This time of what? This time of trouble. Thinking men of this world using biblical language in the explanation of what will be going on in this world. And many of us, sadly, many Seventh-day Adventists deny that there's going to be a time of trouble. Say, oh, that's something that's way out there in the future. 
it's upon us. Yet this time, uh, th what I'm saying, it's upon us. We, 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 we don't have time to play games. We don't have time to live life unskillfully, to live life lazily, to live life without an aim, purpose, understanding of where it is that we are going to, to live life under the, uh, uh, under the perception of the world. Who, the world is going to hate us, the Bible says. So we can't live our life thinking, oh, I want to be loved by the world. I want to be liked by the world. You're going to die. You try to please the world, you're going to die. And I'm not talking about uh, like this death here on earth. I'm talking about like eternal death. That's the death that you will experience if you try to please the world. Because the Bible lets us know in the book of James chapter 4, that those that are the friends of the world, they are the enemies of God. They are at enmity. They are at enmity with God. The friendship of the world is enmity with God, the Bible says. The friendship of the world is enmity with God. A.T. Jones spent a lot of time speaking about that in sermon number 11 of the 1895 sermons. Sermon number 11 of the 1895 sermons. The friendship of the world is enmity with God. You want to be a friend of the world. You want to have the friendship, rather, of the world, meaning you like the things of the world. You care about the things of the world. You will die eternally, necessarily, because this world is destroying itself. If you like the things of the world, then you, then, then, then you like the things that bring destruction. Let me keep on reading here. Yet this time of trouble will bring seeds of social rebirth. Interesting. This time of trouble will bring seeds of social rebirth. Americans will share a great, will share a regret about recent mistakes and resolute new consensus about what to do. They'll see that they will think in their mind, we've made certain mistakes. And they're going to agree, we need to do this. We need to go this way. We need to do this thing. We need to set up the image to the beast. That is the consensus that will come down as a result of the great calamities. The setting up formation of the image of the beast. The very survival of the nation will feel at stake. Sometime before, oh, sometime before the year 2025. What year are we in? 2023. Sometime before the year 2025, America will pass through a great gate and history commensurate with the American Revolution similar to the Civil War and twin emergencies of the Great Depression and World War II. And that's what we're going to go through. According to these men, they're fairly close and correct through their prior predictions, which were based upon their study of history. I highly recommend that you read this book. You, you, you'll see it all. They go through the history of everything. And they point out that right now we're living in a time of stupendous crisis. That's what Sister White said. That's what they're saying. The risk of catastrophe will be very high. The nation could erupt into insurrection. Have you, we heard, we, we heard this word used, insurrection or civil violence, crack up geographically or succumb to authoritarian rule. I mean, it seems as though uh, the general conference, at least the North American division, that seems to maybe crack off geographically from the general conference. But, but that's not what he, they're talking about. They're not talking about Seventh-day Adventism. Um, that seems to be cracking away. Um, they, they're talking about the world. They're talking about the United States of America. It might separate. If there is a war, it is likely to be one of maximum risk and effort. In other words, a total war. So based upon their study, saints, based upon the thinking men of this world, based upon their study, of history and the generations, they look at the, a generation being 20 years, and that's how they do their review. That's how they number their days. They look at generations as 20 years, and every 20 years, they find cycles. They find cycles. They find cycles. 
right? They find cycles of things occurring, the rise and the fall of nations, economic cycles, political cycles, so social cycles that go on. They see seasonality, right? Just like the four seasons, you have the spring, you have the, the summer, you have the fall, and then you, ha you have the winter. Each of them follow one another with regularity. You can't avoid it. You can only prepare for it. And that's why we study history, to prepare for the future. The time that we're living in right now is the time where trouble is going to come. Sadly, as an overwhelming surprise to many, it does not need to be the case, though. It does not need to be the case for us. I'm going to come and put this thing back on the screen because there's something interesting that was said here. He points out the year 2025. He says, around the year 2025, around the year 2025, or before that year, the survival of the nation will feel at stake. Now, we're learning to number our days to apply our hearts to wisdom. We're not learning to number our days so that we could determine the second coming of Jesus Christ, so that we could determine uh, when exactly is the time of trouble going to come. That's not why we're numbering our days. We're numbering our days so that we could apply our hearts to Jesus, so that our hearts can be right when the time of trouble comes. That is why we're numbering our days. So if we're saying years, I don't want anybody, and that's why we've repeated this over and over and over again throughout these series, Nobody should leave this study, this series of study, ever thinking for one moment that we were determining the date of the second coming of Christ because no man knows the day or the hour. We do not know the date of the second coming of Christ. I received an email of one telling me, like, it's going to be at this time. Wrong. Please follow the study. Not true. Erroneous. Wrong. Wrong in every kind of way that you could say it is wrong. We don't know the day nor the hour of the second coming of Jesus Christ right now. We will know after the close of probation by the grace of God. If we know after the day of probation, that means that we are a part of the 140 and 4,000 because they will hear the day and the hour. We studied that already through the Bible and through the spirit of prophecy as well. So the year 2025 is pointed out by the thinking men of this world. And I find that very interesting. And we should be thinking men and women as well. In fact, we're told in the spirit of prophecy that God can do a lot with those who aren't learned and haven't gone to school. You see the, you see the disciples, the fishermen. You had some intelligent people. You had Luke, who was a, who was, who was a doctor. You had Matthew, who was a tax collector. But, but, but the vast majority of them, they were not learned men. But then in the spirit of prophecy, it also says that how much more can God do with intellectual Christians? He can do much more. And that's, that, that's like a plain fact. There's no real argument to that. It's just something to accept because it has to be true because they have maximized the use of the mind that God has given to them so he can do more with that. So we want to be thinking men and thinking women as well. As we think about what they're saying, let's think about what God has to say to us. We see the world and they're coming to this conclusion of something in 2025. Now let's consider our day. Now with our days, with our days, Who's our, by the way? When I'm saying our, I'm speaking about us, Seventh-day Adventists, right? Because if this generation, Jesus said, shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. He wasn't talking about the generations that the thinking men of the world are talking about. He was talking about the last generations. The last generation that he would be working with to finish the work. And we've seen this, and we'll see it again. Generations of Adventism. The Bible teaches us that one generation equals 40 years. We consider that and we saw that already. The texts are right there. So please take this, take this you know, uh, uh, picture. I do have to uh, leave the PowerPoints or at least a few slides or whatnot with this study package in the link below. I haven't done that yet, but I will so you can reference that um, uh, uh, in the future, probably tonight or tomorrow. I will put that in there. Some have asked for it. I just hadn't had the time to put it in there just yet. But we will, and you could have the slides for yourself, the study for yourself, the study notes, et cetera. We're going to look to put everything together in a package uh, for you. But saints, if you have really been blessed by this ministry, by the work that we've been able to do by the grace of God, we ask that you may continue to that you may support us, for one, uh, through your prayer. Support us and the work it is that we're doing because um, I got to tell you, it is 
joy to be able to serve God and to be able to serve you. It is a joy to be able to serve and to share with you the things it is that we've come across. Because, well, if this is what God has called for us to do. It is a great joy and a great honor. So I know we're just in the middle of the study, but I just want to say thank you for blessing me and allowing me to be able to share these studies with you. Now, the generations. The generations here, 40 years equals one generation. We consider the regular generations um, in the time of Israel, a generation that decided to uh, have a king. The generation is the, basically the people have decided, they have made a, a, up their mind, they made a choice to go in a certain direction. And so from that point on, that people, right, will be considered a generation over the time span of 40 years. The result of their choice would, um, would, would mature over the period of 40 years. The result of their choice, follow me, the result of their choice would mature over the period of 40 years, okay? The children of Israel, and, and by the way, so each 40 years, there is a cycle. There's four cycles in each four years. 40 years equals one generation, and judgment falls upon the third and the fourth generation. I'm kind of cruising through this because we've seen all this before. And so with the children of Israel, they had three generations. Let me put this right over here so that we can focus on this. The children of Israel, when we looked at the four generations of the children of Israel after they had chosen to have a king in 1 Samuel chapter 8, the first king that they had was Saul, 40 years. The second king was David, another 40 years. The third king was Solomon, another 40 years. And judgment falls upon the third and the fourth generation. And we see the judgments of God falling upon the third and the fourth generation. This is not an arbitrary act of God where he's like, okay, after, after 80 years, I'm going to start, I'm just going to start just raining down on them. No, you reap what you sow. You reap what you sow. So they have sown the desire for a king and had a king, right? God didn't want them to, but they had a king. So they were going to see the results, the ramifications, the effects, the negative effects of the king, of having a king in the third generation. And that they did. Um, and the fourth generation as well. And the fourth generation, you saw a split. Rehoboam and Jeroboam. There was wars between them continually. We're told. And so we saw that We saw that example with the children of Israel. And surely there are other examples. So if you find other examples in the Bible, do email us and share with us the other examples that you may come across. Where you see a um, a a, a uh, four generations and the uh, judgments falling upon the third and the fourth and the effects there do share that. So back here, not here, but uh, here, it will look like this. There we go. Okay. So then we wanted to apply this to ourselves as the people of God. This generation, the last generation, some of the Adventists, the people of God, from October twenty second. 1844 onwards. And so we learned to number our days. We did go through the 2300 day prophecy with our brother and friend, Pastor Akeem James, to help us kind of get to, okay, where does this begin? That study was entitled 2300 days. So here we know the generations began October 22nd, 1844. And as we number our days from then, 40 years, 40 years, 40 years. The book of Joel is where we spent a decent bit of time in Joel chapter one and in Joel chapter two, where we saw that there was what's called the generation of degradation, the, de the generations of degradation. Joel in Joel chapter one, he identified them as four little pests, four little pests, the palm worm, the locust, the canker worm, the, and the caterpillar. Those were the four little pests that he identified. And then when we went to Joel chapter 2, what we saw in Joel chapter 2 was that God would restore the last generation by pouring out upon them the latter rain. That generation's name is the generation of restoration. Their name is their experience, restoration. Their name is their experience. They were restored. They re restored the things that were lost by the prior generations. And so we took time to study the special truths that God had for each generation. Because God was seeking to restore each of those generations of Adventism. We've read many statements about how God would have returned in each generation. But he was rejected. 
God would have returned in the first generation. But the people lost faith. They fell into Laodicean lukewarmness. We saw the pathology of Laodicean lukewarmness, how they became lukewarm, how they lost sight of Jesus in the first generation. And in that generation, two men were born in 1850 and 1855. A.T. Jones in 1850 and E.J. Wagner in 1855. Both being prepared to do uh, a great work in the beginning of the second generation in 1888. And there in 1888, they were preaching the same message, but with added light. They were preaching justification by faith in the righteousness of Christ. That was the message that was being preached in the dark ages. And sadly, it was becoming a dark time in Adventism. They had lost sight of Jesus. If you can't see Jesus, then, then you can't see anything. If you can't see Jesus, then you can't see anything. They had lost sight of Jesus, the light of life. And Christ was being uplifted by Jones and Wagner in, 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 through the 1888 message. Christ was being uplifted. And God could have returned a few short years after 1888. Sister White even had a statement in 1901 where she said that we would have been in the heavenly Canaan already if the message was not resisted. He said, because of our leading brethren, because of our leading brethren, God, the enemy succeeded, Satan succeeded in shutting away from the people a lar- to a large degree, the light that God wanted to shed upon us as his people. That generation passed. And it's unfortunate because Jesus said, this generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. But that generation passed. The first generation passed. I'm never in them. The second generation passed as well. The second generation had resisted the message. They had resisted it. The presentation of Christ, the uplift of the Savior, the sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. When the message comes to you, how does your heart respond? When Christ comes to you, when Christ comes to you with the ministry of reconciliation, when Christ comes to you with his love, his temperance, In the way that you eat, his temperance, in the way that you work, his temperance, in the way that you socialize, his temperance, how do you respond? Because before you could be a patient saint, you got to be a temperate saint. And before you can even be a temperate saint, you got to have faith. Because to faith virtue, and then to virtue, you add temperance, and then to temperance, you add knowledge, and then to knowledge, patience. Virtue, knowledge, and then to knowledge, temperance, and then to temperance, patience. Peter's Ladder. I recommend that you review our podcast uh, looking at uh, the Christian experience, um, Peter's, Peter's Ladder, where we go through all those things. Are, are you having that experience? Is that your way of life every single day? Are you striving every day to be like Jesus? Because we can look at our history. We can see the things that were done, the generations of degradation. But is your Christian walk, is your spiritual experience degrading right now? How is your faith? Today, how's your experience with Christ today? The experience of God's people, sadly, back then, happy Sabbath, sister Tamika. The experience of the people back then, sadly, that rejected the message in the second generation 
And from then, things continue to degrade even worse. As we know, judgment falls upon the third and the fourth generation. Judgment falls upon the third and the fourth generation. Now, again, this is not an arbitrary act of God where he's like, okay, the third and the fourth, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make it rain on you. No, it's not the arbitrary act of God. It's that you reap what you sow. So the rejection of the swelling of the third angel's message in the first generation and the ultimate rejection, the great rejection in October, in, in, in 1888, it was November, December 1888, where the ministerial conference as well as the, and then after that, the a general conference occurred where Captain Wagner preached the message. The rejection of the messages between 1888, even to 1901, because in 1893 and 1895 and 1897, Messages continued to go out. And it was like a trio, Jones, Wagner, and Sister White. They were going out and about and sharing this gospel so powerfully. I mean, eventually they got tired of Sister White and stripped her off, exiled her to Australia. I said, okay. And God didn't tell me to go out here, but you guys are, you guys are fortunate. What am I supposed to do? She did an amazing work out there, nevertheless. You can't do anything against the truth before it. Wherever you put God's people, they're going to do something amazing regardless. The people resisted the message, sadly. And so we would, we, we're going to see the great effects of that in the third and the fourth generation, necessarily. And what do we find there in the third and the fourth generation? Well, in the 19, uh, 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 in the 19 uh, late 40s, 50s, 60s, right? There's a couple things that have happened there. There are several things that have happened there. We studied this before. We looked at this before most recently, right? We have Donald Whelan and then we have Ro uh, Robert Whelan, pardon me, Robert Whelan. And Donald K. Short, these two elders, they came back across the 1888 message. They had never seen it before. It was amazing to them. And they saw it late, you know, like they already gone through school and things like that. And they've seen this message and it absolutely blew their minds away. They thought it was so amazing that Christ is a personal savior for them. They came to understand it deeper, especially Robert Whelan, um, the covenants. The, the, the old and the new covenant, the old covenant being the, 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 the efforts of man to fulfill the righteousness of the law, and the new covenant being the law written in your heart. Both covenants trying to um, accomplish the same thing, one with the energy of the flesh, that is the old covenant, and the other by faith in Christ and in Christ alone. One um, sought to fulfill the righteousness of the law with the old man and the other would experience the righteousness of the law through the new man. They came to understand that and it made so clear to them how we and everybody is saved. It is through the righteousness of Christ. Nobody is saved one way before the cross and another way after the cross because that's the idea that many uh, share in regards to the old and the new covenant. The old covenant, you know, uh, we have to do these works and stuff like that. And if you don't, then God doesn't love you. You're not going to be saved. In the new covenant, ah, now there's a new way because Jesus did this. And so now you can be saved like this. No, there is no other name under heaven whereby we must be saved, save the name of Jesus. You see, when A.T. Jones and E.J. Wagner, particularly Wagner, when he was preaching the message of the covenant with clarity, Sister White said that I, this is the clearest that I've heard this ever. Except uh, through the conversations that I had with my husband. But when I heard these messages being presented, every fiber of my heart said amen. She recognized the potency of the messages and so did Robert Whelan and got Donald K. Short. And so they, 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 they were urging the church to go back to the messages. And they were very faithful and very faithful and loyal members of the church. They said, we must go back to these messages. We have to repent from having had rejected this message. What's the evidence that we've rejected this message? The fact that we don't share it. The fact that we don't make reference to it. The fact that we don't talk more about it. The fact that we don't make more prominent the messages that Jones and Wagner and Sister White had shared. We always keep on talking about, oh, they left the faith. Not, Jones, not Sister White, but Jones and Wagner. We keep on mentioning they left the faith and went wrong and this and that and this and that. What was the message that they gave? Focus on the message. Focus on the messages. In fact, Sister White said, um, uh, 
Oh, my book is like over there. But anyway, the, oh, this is the right gift. She says that God has shown to me that these messages would need to be brought back to the forefront. That these messages would come back. And that's what we, and I believe that's what you would also determine to do. Bring these messages back to your churches. When you're doing Sabbath school, share share a quote, share something of these messages. Let us make this thing more prominent. Let everybody hear and know that there was a message that was given back in 1888. God is calling for us to do that. He had Robert Whelan and Donald K. Short doing that in the 1950s and 60s. The book, I believe, was published in 19. 19- 87, I don't know, not 1987. Uh, the book was published uh, several years later. Uh, that is 1888 Reexamined. That was written by Donald Shore and Robert Whelan. And that book was a manuscript form that they used to, be, to bring to the general conference, show them point by point, and give them full evidence of the history of 1888. Susan White's pointing out that the message was resisted and our need to go back to that message and the importance of that message. But still to this day, it hasn't been fully embraced. Which is which, which, which is the point, which is to show that it has been resisted. Sister White said, under inspiration, that this is the message that God commanded to be given to the world. It is the loud cry, this testimony to, the, to ministers, page 91 and paragraph 2. This is the man, message that God commanded to be given to this world. It is the third angel's message which is to be attended with the outpouring of the Holy Spirit in a large measure. It is the latter rain message. It's the latter rain message, saints. And so Robert Willen and Donald K. Short were urging the church, we need to go back to this. But what was the judgment that was falling upon the church around that time? In the late, later portion of the third generation, it's good that Robert Willen and Donald K. Short are doing that, but what was the, was there something bad that was going on? Was there something wrong that was going on with the Sabbath, Sister Rose? Was there something wrong that was going on in the latter end of the third generation? Yes. While Robert Whelan and Donald K. Short are going through that, there was something else that was going on. There were some secret meetings going on at the General Conference. Now, there's a book that's called Our Evangelical Earthquake. If you go in the study package of this video, if you look in the link below, study package, go to that link. The book, Our Evangelical Earthquake, is in there. You must read that book. You must read that book. You must know the history. You must know what happened to our church. Sister White said, books of a new order would be written. Our religion would be changed. And that's what was going on in the late, later portion of the third generation. Our religion was being changed and nobody knew it. Nobody knew it. Different things and different books were being changed and written. And our Bible commentaries. and things. I have so many examples that we can't go through right now, but examples about how like different uh, commentaries on, on, on different texts in the Bible, First Corinthians and Romans, would, would be switched up in regards to like, for example, um, the, Bible talks, the Bible talks about how we were reconciled to God, right? God didn't have a problem with us. It's we that had the problem. Right. But the but but the commentary was making it out to seem as though God had a problem with us. So basically he needed to be appeased. And that's how we can be friends again. So that's how it was commented in the book of Romans, but it was commented differently in the book of First Corinthians. Now, they caught that error. It, it was something. That, well, yeah, they did catch it, but there's a whole story behind it. One day I'll take the time to actually go through that story. But the point of that story is that people in in charge were changing the way that comments were made about certain things in the Bible. And those books were being sent, shipped worldwide, Germany, et cetera. And then they stopped printing them and that's like corrected it. And it's just a big mess. What's the point? The point is that the devil, the enemy of all souls, would muddy the waters, would confuse us concerning our doctrines, confuse us concerning our view and our understanding of the kind of person that God is. That's what he wants to do in this generation because he knows that this last generation is the generation that is to give the last rays of merciful light, the last message of mercy to this world, which is the revelation of God's character of love. Everything that the devil is doing, everything that he's doing is to give this last generation the wrong picture of the kind of person that God is. 
So if he can mess up our understanding of righteousness by faith, then, then, then he will cause us to not be interested in understanding what righteousness is itself. Because the next step after experiencing righteousness by faith is going deeper into our understanding of righteousness. Martin Luther did not understand righteousness by faith fully, but he preached it. Have you heard some of the things that he said about the Jews? And we've shared it here before. Well, before I even mention that, Martin Luther didn't believe in the book of Revelation. He said, I can't see Christ in here. Martin Luther didn't believe in the book of Jude. He said it's too similar to, um, to, to, the, um, to, to Peter. Um, he didn't believe in the book of James because it's works. He didn't believe in the book of Hebrews as well. So there's a lot of things that Martin Luther was missing. He didn't have the great controversy uh, uh, theme and understanding as well because he doesn't believe in, didn't really understand the book of Revelation. There was a lot that he was missing. Nevertheless, the little, with the little that he had, he was a blessing to many. Some of the things that he would say about the Jews were just, just horrible, just cruel. In fact, Hitler used some of his quotes to do his work. Study the history. He actually used some of the things that Martin Luther was saying to do the work that he was doing. Oh, yes. Now, Martin Luther had many wonderful things to say concerning righteousness by faith. Many wonderful things to say, but there was still more for him to experience in terms of righteousness. Okay? So we could have the message, experience righteousness by faith and understand it, but there are levels, there are degrees, there's growth, Christian growth. And this last generation is going to have the highest experience with God than any previous generation. And even higher than those who actually went up to heaven without seeing death. What does this mean? This means that this generation is not only concentrated on salvation or translation, but on the vindication of the character of God. This generation is the generation that is finally going to really and truly be God's friend. You see, regular people uh, who may believe in God, etc. they, particularly the legalists, legalists are people who are preoccupied with their legal standing before God. That's what they're preoccupied with. They're preoccupied with their legal standing before God. So they think about the investigative judgment as God is going to look at me and, oh my goodness, if I'm wrong, then he's, not, he's going to have his frown upon me and I'm going to die. That's the legalistic view of God. That's how the legalist looks at things. The legalist is preoccupied with how do I look before God? God's friend is preoccupied with how does God look before the universe? And how God looks before the universe is how you look. When the world looks at your life, how does God look? When the universe looks at your life, how does God look? The hour of his judgment is come. In this generation, God is being judged based upon the life of his people. Are his people being judged? Yes. But, but let's be a little bit more God-centered instead of self-centered, focused on me, me, me. How do I look before God? How does God look before the world? Through your life. You see, when, when that is our priority, salvation is already secured. When our priority, when our preoccupation is, how does my life reveal the goodness, the truth of God? Salvation is already secured. Translation, without seeing death, is a maybe, but you're not too concerned about that either. Your priority is the vindication of the character of God. Your priority is giving the last rays of merciful life, that last message of mercy to this world, to your life, which is the revelation of God's character of love. The devil wants to make us misunderstand the kind of person that God is. And before even, I mean, he marred God's character, but... He seeks to get us through misunderstanding the experience that God wants us to have with him. 
which is Christ in us, the hope of glory. And so there we had an earthquake. It's called our evangelical earthquake, where evan evangelicals came, Barnhouse, Walter Martin. And they came to our church and were requesting that we answer certain questions. And through this, these several conversations, these 18 meetings that were had, they spoke about the atonement, they spoke about the nature of Jesus Christ, they spoke about the sanctuary, they spoke about the authority of the spirit of prophecy, they spoke about so many different things, and they sought to tear down our doctrine. And sadly, those who were in those meetings, Froom, Leroy Froom, um, Anderson, Reed, these individuals that were in the meetings, they were they were rephrasing things concerning our doctrine. Our doctrines were being changed. Read the book, Our Evangelical Earthquake. It's in the study guide. Go in the study package, click in there, and you're going to see the PDF for Our Evangelical, Our Evangelical Earthquake. The whole entire history is right there. You must read it. You need to know what happened in the latter end of the third generation. You need to know that for yourself. You're not going to read that in the Sabbath school. You're going to go to Sabbath school tomorrow morning. You're not going to read it. Nobody, nobody's going to tell you that. One, because nobody knows. But really, nobody really knows. And two, those that do know that that's too controversial, it's too divisive, so we don't want to talk about it. If you want to talk about it? Fine, I'm going to read about it myself. But read that book so you can know what happened in this last generation that we are to be a part of. And you're going to see that our religion was being changed and diluted. It was being degraded. As Joel said, it was being degraded in generations of degradation. And then when you get to the fourth generation, you find more of that especially through the way that we organize ourselves as a church. I mean, the organization was in 1863, but the way that we continue to organize, centralize things and things like that, um, it wasn't getting any better. It wasn't getting any better, especially in the fourth generation of Adventism. We started to do more activities. But sadly, that wasn't what God really wanted, which was true conversion. If there was, then Christ would have returned, wouldn't he? If there was, then Christ would have returned. Where is he? Hmm? Where is he? He's not here. He's still in the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary, cleansing the sanctuary. Why? Because it is still filthy. It is still filthy. The third generation passed. The fourth generation passed. But this generation shall not pass. This generation is the generation of restoration. This is the generation where the sanctuary will be restored. How do I know? Because the Bible tells me so. And I'm going to live as though that is the case. How about you? God wants you to live as though this generation is the final generation. And this generation is the last generation. That will give the last rays of merciful light. We have the Bible. We have the spirit of prophecy. Oh, goodness gracious, we have the thinking men of this world who are saying that something, they don't know what, would happen around the year 2025. Now, we're not to live saying, okay, something's going to happen, so I need to, you know, I need to, you know, I don't know. God wants us to have a sense of holy urgency. God wants us to. Uh, receive him because he's attractive, because he's lovely, not out of fear, not of, out of anxiety. No, but we are to recognize that, well, the thinking men of this world were pointing to, um, to 2025, about 2025, and we studied the watches of the night. We studied the four watches of the night, and we see that right now we are living in the midnight watch. We're living in the midnight watch in this generation. So we're in the generation of restoration, which is from 2004 to 2044. But now when we go within the generation, there are four watches. In each generation, there are four watches, the watches of the night. We've taken the time to study that, so please go back to prior studies if you're not familiar with the watches of the night. We went through that very, very thoroughly. So in the watches, there are four watches in the night, okay? Each watch is one decade. The same way in the night, there are 12 hours in the night. Jesus said that there are 12 hours in the day. Therefore, there are 12 hours in the night. And each watch is divided evenly, three hours per watch. Well, in the generation, there are 40 years. So it has to be divided evenly, 40 years. If we do an equal division, an equal distribution of four across 40, 
we get 10. So each watch is one decade. So each decade represents a watch of the night. There is the evening watch, the midnight watch, the popcorn watch, and the morning watch. And right now we are living in the midnight watch of this generation of restoration. Now in this generation of restoration, in the midnight watch, we are near the end. We are near the end of the midnight watch. And the end of the midnight watch is what year do you see there? What year do you see there as the end of the midnight watch? The year that you see is 2024. I'm not saying something's going to happen in 2024, but I, actually, I will say that something's going to happen in 2024. In 2024, something is going to happen. Listen to me very, very clearly. In 2024, something is going to happen. Everyone that was born in the beginning of this generation, meaning in 2004, Everyone that was born in 2004 is going to be 20 years old. That's what's going to happen in 2024. Somebody says, okay, thanks. No, 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 you're, you're welcome. What does that mean? Well, at the age of 20 is the age where the youth were able to go to war. That's the coming of age. That's when they can be a part of the army. Yes, we're, we're talking about an army of you. Really trained. Young men, men, send me an email. As we've said earlier in this stream, send me an email, lastgreatministries at gmail.com. We want to connect with you. At the end of 2024, those who were born in the beginning of this generation of restoration, they will become 20. That's the coming of age. They're ready to go to war. And right now we're living in a war, a great controversy. It's a war in our mind. It is, it is the battle of righteousness and unrighteousness. And we are right now coming to the end of the midnight watch. And we know that in the midnight watch, the midnight crime is given, right? And we are to give the midnight cry continued, but that's to swell into the loud cry. At midnight, Joseph said that trouble comes, but also we're told that at midnight that God delivers his people. And the psalmist says that he will praise God at midnight for his goodness and for his righteous judgments. We are living right now in a time where there's a perfect window of opportunity to hasten the second coming of Jesus Christ. We are living right now in a time as we have numbered our days where we could finish the work and Jesus could come to claim us as his own. We are living in a time where we must make a decision upon which side of the controversy we are going to stand. Those who wait for the bridegroom's coming are to say to the people, behold your God. The last rays of merciful light, the last message of mercy to be given to the world is a revelation of his character of love. The children of God are to manifest his glory in his own life, in their own life and character. They are to reveal what the grace of God has done for them. The light of the son of righteousness is to shine forth in good works, in words of truth and deeds of holiness. This generation of restoration shall not pass until all these things be fulfilled. This last generation is to give the last rays of merciful light. The truth 
are the kind of person that our God is. How has God been revealing himself to you? How has God been living out his life in you? How have you been surrendering yourself to him? Now that you know all these things that we've reviewed and studied throughout this series, now that you see the time that we're living in, the opportunity that we have, now that you see that not only the thinking men of this world have their opinions on the time where things will happen, but the Bible shows us where we are. What are you going to do about it? God has shown us the time. He's given to us the message. And he's told us the work that we have to do at this time. What are you going to choose to do about it? What efforts are you putting forth to finish the work? And when I say finish the work, I'm not just talking about knocking on doors, giving out pamphlets. I'm talking about the work in the heart. Heart work with Christ is what we need. A true transformation in your soul and in my soul is what we need. We need the truth as it is in Jesus, not the lies and the heresies of, of, of the fallen churches of Babylon, of the defectors of Seventh-day Adventism, namely Desmond Ford. He pointed him out last week. He pointed out again the doctrine that he was bringing forth that was causing that caused so many Seventh-day Adventist ministers to either leave the faith or to remain in the faith and preach lies to people from the pulpit. You know that that happens, don't you? You know that that happens, don't you? There are, I, I met myself, a man, who preached at my church. And he was a pastor, he was a teacher for other pastors, a teacher in New Testament theology at Northern Caribbean University. And he believed in the book Question on Doctrine. He believed in a number of other false doctrines. Didn't believe in the investigative judgment. And a few years later, left the faith. Wrote a volume, a book, on why we don't need to keep the seventh day Sabbath. I've seen it myself with my own two eyes, experienced it and, 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 and known it for myself. That this is happening. And he was teaching people, men that would be pastors in our church. And people like him and others, what they tell the students, don't leave. Stay there and spread the truth, their truth. And so our religion is being changed, watered down. And many of us are asleep. And with those false doctrines polluting our minds, we're becoming drunk with the wine of Babylon while in the remnant church. Does that remind you of the parable that Jesus gave of the lost coin? That coin was lost in the house. It was inside the house, but lost. It's not about where you are. It's not about who you're connected with. It's not about, oh, I'm in this present truth group. I'm in that present truth group. I'm with this independent ministry. I'm with that independent church. I follow that minister over there. I listen to this minister over here. You'll still be lost unless Jesus is the Lord of your life. Do you know him? as it is your privilege to know him. Is he a familiar friend to you? Or is your connection with him connected to somebody else? Maybe the church that you go to, the ministry that you listen to, or whatever. There's no mediator between God and man, save the man Christ Jesus. Do you know him? Saints, it is my prayer that we apply our hearts to 
Christ. And with Christ, he will give us new views of the truth about the kind of person that our Heavenly Father is. And that is the truth that we need in our minds in order to make it through the time of trouble. Because in that time, if you don't know Jesus, you are going to doubt the Father. If you don't know him, you're going to question the Father and say, how can you do this? You are so cruel. You are so wicked. You are so evil. You're going to think the worst about God in the time of trouble unless you are settled, rooted, and grounded in the truth as it is in Jesus. Because that time of trouble, such as never was, it, 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 trouble is often worse in anticipation than in actuality. But with the time of trouble, no, it's going to be worse than what you're anticipating. The time of trouble is going to be worse than what we are anticipating. I'm not doing this to make us afraid or anything like that. That's really not my point. If anything, and if that's how it comes off, then it's just an emergency measure that I'm using to encourage you to look unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of your faith. Take time to read the 1895 sermons written by A.T. Jones. Read the book, 1888 and Introduction, 1888 and Introduction by Robert Dillon. Read uh, The Desire of Ages. Read about Christ. Immerse yourself in his experience. Listen to things about him. Learn of him who is meek and lowly in heart. Follow Jesus and you will never be lost. Father in heaven, we're so grateful to be in this generation. You have worked it out that we would be here in such a time as this. None of us are mistakes. None of our lives are doomed if we would look unto Jesus. None of our life is worth it if we would align ourselves with Christ. And that is just what we would do, Father. We thank you for the series where we've been able to number our days to apply our hearts to wisdom. We thank you for all the pastors and ministers that have come on to shed light on what you have given to them in relation to the latter rain, in relation to the message that would prepare your people for these final moments of earth's history. Lord, we ask that you may give us a heart to be even more committed to you, to understanding the time, the message, and the work that you have for us in this time. Lord, we would give the last rays of merciful light to this world, the last rays of hope, God. This is the truth about the kind of person that you are the lover of our souls, the one who will never give up on us. God, help us to now really and truly apply our hearts to wisdom so that we can be in that number that will see you when you come. Bless all those who are watching. Bless all those who will watch this in the future. I pray. Forgive us of all of our sins. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Saints, again, I pray that you have been blessed by this series. We will have new ones in the future, podcasts to come, times like these to come. Um, meetings to come as well. So we ask that you, number one, pray for us. Continue to pray for us, this ministry and the work that God wants to continue to do with us. Pray for us. We need it. Support the work that God has blessed us to do. The things it is that we're able to write and to share, and distribute, the videos, the podcasts. We need your support. If you have been blessed, if you have been appreciative, support the work. Stay tuned as we will continue to have more and more coming your way so that not only you can be blessed, but your families can be blessed as well. Men, this is an announcement to the men. 
send us an email at lastrayministries at gmail.com. That is lastrayministries at gmail.com. We want to connect with you. There's a work that God has for us to do. So men, send us an email. Again, that is lastrayministries at gmail.com. We need to communicate. There's a work that we need to do in these final moments of Earth's history. Saints, we also have a prayer line Sabbath mornings at 9 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. It's for about 45, 50 minutes. If you'd like to join us, stay connected with us. Uh, while there are some times where we might not stream or whatnot, you can still stay connected with us. You can come on our prayer line. Just send us an email, lastrayministries at gmail.com. We'll send you this link. And you can join whichever Sabbaths you like. Don't worry about it. Come whenever it is that you would like. And we will be there. We'll pray with you. We will share God's promises with you. We will encourage you. We just want to be there for you. We just want to be there for you. And it's just a few of us friends. Well, we know each other because we've all you know, agreed to just come on uh, through here. And be blessed by what it is that we're able to do by the grace of God. If you'd like to support the ministry, you could always do so. The uh, links are provided below, PayPal, Cash App. You could always uh, uh, donate through there. Um, or Zell Pay, that's the best one, Zell Pay. The email for Zell Pay is lastwayministries at gmail.com. You could uh, 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 just do that through there and um, know that we are continuing to do the God's work. I see the comments. Brother Rodney, God bless you, my brother. I pray that God may continue to richly bless you. Yes, A.T. Jones sermons are very, very good. A great blessing. I bless this Sabbath to everyone who has been so uh, uh, kind to come on to uh, wish uh, the best to us. We wish the best to you and to your family as well. Now I won't hold you any longer. I do like to linger around with you all. I pray that one day we could all meet. But in the meanwhile, it's my prayer that we all get closer to Jesus. And in due time, we will all meet by the grace of God. God bless you and have a happy and wonderful rest of your Sabbath evening. God bless you.